Hello everyone and thanks for watching EduPD videos. We finally get to the problem which made quantum mechanics famous among physicists and that is when we were able to predict the values of the energy levels of hydrogen atoms using the Schrodinger equation in three dimensions. Now this is the situation for the hydrogen atom where you have a proton and an electron is revolving around it. So the proton has a positive charge plus E the electron has a negative charge minus E and there are no other particles, no neutrons, no nothing. And this is what makes it a very simple system, the hydrogen atom. And what we'll assume is, is this plus E is situated at the origin and minus E is moving somewhere around it. And we'll also assume that because the proton is much more massive than the electron, that it is staying stationary, that only the electron is moving. So the proton is stationary at the origin and in this case, the potential V of R will come out to be the standard Coulomb potential E into minus E. So this is minus E squared by 4 pi epsilon naught into 1 by R. This is all that we needed to solve the radial equation. We needed the Coulomb potential V as it depends on R. And this is what we already know. The total wave function first, psi of R theta phi, which is what we need to find out is equal to r of r theta of theta phi of phi. We already know what theta of theta is. That is equal to a constant a times p l m of cos theta where l and m are integers and phi of phi is equal to e to the power iota m phi and we already know some constraints L and M are integers and M is equal to 0 or plus minus 1 or plus minus 2 till plus minus L meaning mod M is less than equal to L. Now our goal is to find R of R which is the radial function and the equation which we were left with was D by DR times R squared D by DR minus 2m r squared by h squared v of r minus e r and this is equal to l into l plus 1 r. Now we can simplify this equation a bit by changing some variables. First we'll take a new function u of r. This will be equal to r of r times r. This is just because you have r squared dr by dr and things like that. This will just make it easier. I'll not go into the complete details, but this will make the equation minus h square by 2m d2u by dr squared. Now our goal is to find u. Once we find u, we already know capital R plus v plus h square by 2m l into l plus 1 by r squared u is equal to eu. So this is the final equation we get which we need to solve. Now here something is interesting. The potential v has been replaced by v plus h square by 2m l into l plus 1 by r squared. This extra term is basically increasing v outside uh, by a particular value depending on the radius. So it is what is called a centrifugal term because it is something that tends to send the particle away from the origin. In this case, V becomes infinite as R goes approaches zero. So this centrifugal term tends to throw the particle away from the origin and this is responsible for some interesting effects. One more thing that we need to see is the normalization was R squared, R squared dr is equal to one. And this normalization now becomes integral and R obviously goes from zero to infinity, not minus infinity to infinity. That's a mistake which many beginners uh, make. X, Y and Z go from minus infinity to infinity, but R goes from zero to infinity. So this becomes mod U squared dr is equal to one. This will be the normalization constant, normalization constraint rather. And now this V, we already know what this is equal to minus e square by 4 pi epsilon naught into 1 by r. So let's look at the final equation which we are left with. 
it's a pretty long equation and we won't go into the details of it like I said minus h square by 2m d2u by dr square our goal now is to find u plus minus e square by 4 pi epsilon naught r plus h square by 2m l into l plus 1 by r squared u is equal to e of u. So this is what we need to solve now. Now the mathematics once again is quite difficult and I won't go into the detail. I'll just write down all the important things which are the final conclusions. The first is in any equation like this we always try to separate the variables to make the equations easier. Not separate the variables my apologies. To change the variables in order to make the equations easier. So there are some substitutions which we'll do. K is equal to root of minus 2 m e by h and rho is equal to k times r and when we make these substitutions finally we'll get r of r which is what we needed to find out from u will come out to be 1 by r rho to the power l plus 1 e to the power minus rho rho is just a scaling factor with r e to the power minus rho, v of rho, where v of rho is a polynomial of degree n minus l minus 1, where n is called the principal quantum number. And we can see that it will only be non-zero when l, when n minus l minus 1 is maximum 0, or l has the values 0, 1, 2, till n minus 1. Once l is equal to n minus 1, this term becomes 0 and we don't have anything beyond that. Also, the most important thing, we get the value of energy. We can already see from here that the energy has to be negative and we are finally able to determine the values of energy and they once again depend on the principal quantum number En. This comes out to be minus m is the mass of the electron by the way. times 1 by n squared and this is equal to e1 by n squared. So whatever the energy is, the ground state has an energy e1 where n is equal to 1 and then the energy is this uh, e1 by n squared. So n is a number, principal quantum number and it determines the energy and it is an integer. So when n is 0, we call that the uh, ground state. We can have n is equal to 1, n is equal to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and so on and L is the azimuthal quantum number and it is equal to either 0 or 1 or 2 until n minus 1. So if n is equal to 4 then L can have 4 values 0, 1, 2 and 3 and M for each L M has 2n plus 1 values 0 plus minus 1 plus minus 2 till plus minus L. This is the azimuthal quantum number, this is the principal quantum number. This is the most important result which enables us to explain the spectrum of hydrogen atom and if you can see this result, it is the same thing we obtained by the uh, not exactly correct derivation which we did in previous courses where we assumed that the angular momentum L was equal to nh by 2 pi. That was an arbitrary quantization which we put. But this is the actual answer which we get using Schrodinger equation and once again we can see the same dependence En is equal to E1 by N squared. Now what does this tell us? This tells us that by the way E1 comes out to be minus 13.6 electron volts because everything here is known. H is a constant, epsilon it is a constant, E is the charge of a uh, electron and M is the mass of an electron. So E1 comes out to be minus 13.6, E2 comes out to be approximately minus 3.4 and so on. So this enables us to determine what is called the spectrum of hydrogen. We have many energy levels. Let's say the energy level E1, which is the bottommost one, which is minus 13.6. And then you have E2, which is equal to E1 by 4 and that is equal to minus 3.4. And then you have some value E3, 
which will be equal to E1 by 9 and so on and En is equal to E1 by N square. Now let's say uh, an electron is initially in this state E3 where N is equal to 3 and drops down to this state N is equal to 2. So the initial energy was E1 by N1 squared and the final energy was E1 by N2 squared which tells us hc by lambda which will be the energy of the photon emitted this is equal to e1 times 1 by n1 squared minus 1 by n2 squared and the moment you see this you should realize what we've accomplished this is basically the rydberg series these are the lyman series balmer series and so on which basically tell us that when you have an electron going from 2 to 3 what the wavelength of the emitted photon will be when you have an electron going from 3 to 1 what the energy of the emitted photon would be or what the energy of the absorbed photon would be if an electron goes from say 2 to 3. Right. So this is the formula which basically told us we are on the right track because this is something that can be measured experimentally. You can see, you can try to somehow put an electron in the energy state, let's see if n is equal to 5 and then you will see that it gives us various emission spectrums, various photons when it comes down to the ground state, one can correspond to 5 to 1. Another can correspond to 5 to 3, then 3 to 2, then 2 to 1 and so on. So this is the emission spectrum and we can exactly measure the wavelengths of these lights by doing other experiment and this told us that we are on the right track. This was first remember discovered by Bohr. This was postulated by Bohr but that was a fraudulent derivation where we assumed a quantization L is equal to NH by 2 pi. But in this case, we didn't assume anything. We started from the three-dimensional Schrodinger equation in the spherical coordinates. We put in the value V of R, which was equal to minus E squared by 4 pi epsilon naught into 1 by R. And the mathematics is complicated. I suggest you once look at it into some textbook instead of doing it yourself, because that turns out to be complicated. And obviously, we are able to calculate these results. The moment we get En is equal to E1 by N squared, we have discovered something which earlier was postulated by Bohr. And one thing I'll also in the end mention is uh, this is often written as 1 by lambda. This equation is written as 1 by lambda is equal to R times 1 by N1 squared minus 1 by N2 squared. This is the mathematical version or the experimentalist version because this is basically lambda depending on these two things. And if N1 is 1, it is called the Lyman series. If n1 is 2, it is called the Balmer series. If n1 is 3, it is called the Bastion series and so on. So now we've seen what the eigenvalue of the energy is, but we haven't really focused on the eigenfunctions. In the next video, we'll look at the eigenfunctions and we'll see a property which we had in classical mechanics, but we haven't yet seen in quantum mechanics, the property of angular momentum. Because obviously, if an electron is revolving around a proton, it will have some angular momentum. And we'll see that the angular momentum turns out to be much more interesting compared to the classical case. And it gives us a lot more things that we can actually measure in experiments to check our validity. Thank you.